But once again, happy Tuesday, right? All right, we're going to finish this today. Um, and I've been going very slow on it. I'm going to go faster today. A lot of us I should say faster. We're just almost done with it. So it'll be done sooner today. I want to call your attention again to the, the five new games that we talked about last time. Um, big thing here is, is the philosopher kings for the aristocracy. Now, uh, when he was asking last time, have we ever had this in the world before? Because by aristocracy, we typically think of it like kings, queens, you know, monarchies, things like that, a ruling class. Uh, he means it as a ruling class, but by ruling class, he's talking about these guys specifically or guys and girls, actually, the philosopher kings. And those are people who are specifically trained to rule over others. They're, um, we might think, like, well, yeah, but aren't they going to become tyrants, just like the oligarchy? Uh, in his mind, no, because once you're trained up in the proper ways, you won't deviate from the proper ways. And because we're taking not just average people off of the street, but we're finding people who specifically are that thing, it'd be very difficult for them to be corrupted, because that's their nature. So we're taking people who have the nature to be just rulers, and then we're training them to be just rulers. His idea is that once you do that, a person won't deviate from that course. So have we ever seen this before in real life? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, if you go and look up the, the, the five good emperors, the five good emperors in, in Roman history, they were kind of raised up this way, the last of which was Marcus Aurelius, who we talk about sometimes, the Stoic philosopher. Uh, but, still, but then again, he raised up his, uh, his, his child, Commodus, who became a terrible emperor. But Marcus Aurelius was brought up at a, at a, from a very young age. He was adopted and, and brought up to become the, the, the emperor. And Marcus Aurelius was a, was a fantastic emperor, man. Um, Made a mistake at the end, he devalued the Roman currency, which caused problems for a couple hundred years. But he, he was brought up, how about this? He was brought up to be the emperor, along with his brother. And he refused to take power until his brother and him could take it at the same time. Because he didn't want to, you know, become, the, if, if they swear one of you in it before, and then the other one, then it's like, well, you're the older one, because he was older than his brother, right? I think like 10 years. Uh, they might be like, well, you're the older brother. He didn't want there to be any kind of a power discrepancy between the two of them. He wanted them to be equal in all these things. He's a guy who uh, was the richest man in the world, and yet he dressed as a common person. You know, not like, you know, you know but don't think of common, like, poor with rags. He dressed normally, but he didn't wear, you know, the purple gowns, and he didn't have his big, you know, retinue with him and, and all that. He, would, he lived very simply. And again, the wealthiest man in the world. Uh, he had one wife, and he was devoted to her his entire life. He didn't take mistresses, which again was very uncommon for, for Roman emperors. So he, was, he dressed as a normal person, he acted as a normal person should, um, he was loyal in his, in his relationships. So he's, a, a pro, he, he's considered the last great Roman emperor, and then everything kind of starts to unwind at that point. But it's interesting because he was a Stoic philosopher. He knew Plato. Not personally, but he knew the philosophy of Plato. And he based a lot of himself off of that. He said he to raise this group up. Now, the point I wanted to get across last time was that, you remember that I was saying, all of these things, like if you start off as an aristocracy, over time, you degenerate into a democracy. Because we're here, but eventually you've got the powerful people who just kind of start to take over because they're more powerful. And they're based on honor. So up here, it's based off of merit. And then you can kind of see how honor, like to be, to be an honorable person, is kind of like having merit. You know, you kind of deserve it because you're honorable. In other words, this is kind of an imitation of this. It's a degeneration, but it's kind of an imitation. You follow? Like, if you give me a picture, and then you ask me to copy it, I go, okay, and not to trace, even if I trace it. Yeah, perfect. I'll say I traced it. Can you tell the difference between the one that's been traced and the original? Probably. Yeah. You can tell the difference. It's pretty close, maybe. But you can tell the difference. This is pretty close, but you can tell the difference. This is kind of close to this, but, but you can tell the difference. This is kind of close to this, but you can tell the difference. This is basically this, just with one person instead of many, but you can tell the difference. 
the difference between this and this, man, you can tell the difference. <laughs> but it's little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. And that's important for his, for his overall philosophy as well. As we're going to see, he believes that what we're experiencing in this world, in this life, is an imitation of things beyond. Does that make sense, the imitation part? Okay, good. All right, trial and death of Socrates. Um, I'll tell you now what you get out of this. So Socrates eventually, uh, the best known, by the, the, the best known story of his, of his trial and death occurs from Plato. It's called the trial and death of Socrates. It's broken up into four, uh, four main parts, four dialogues. You don't need to know that. But you should read them, because they're brilliant. Anyway, in 399 BC, Socrates was called to court, and he was charged with two really, really significant crimes. The first one, I want you guys to get this, is impiety. Impiety. He was charged with impiety. And impiety means it's a, um, uh, irreligious, to defy the gods. So if there's some act that's impious, it means it's against the gods. So he's charged with essentially being against the gods of Athens. And he's got, and there are two main reasons he's charged with this. First off, he refuses to recognize the Athenian gods. So he's called an atheist. And then secondly, he's accused of introducing a new god into Athens, a god that's different from the gods of Athens. And what's fascinating about Socrates is that he's, he's in Athens. And, and he's, of course, been raised up there. He knows the deities of Athens. But there's a really strong case to be made that Socrates was a monotheist. That he, and he was a monotheist. And he believed that there was one supreme god. Uh, we see him argue for this. It makes sense. Doesn't, in fact, he, he points out that having multiple gods at war with each other doesn't make sense. But having a single god who's in charge seems to make more sense. He doesn't name this god. He doesn't even say this is the way it certainly is. He's just kind of pontificating. He's thinking about it. So, he's charged with impiety. Now, the, the, the new and different god that he's charged with is called his, his uh, we can refer to it as his daemon. Which is creepy. What does that sound like? The word daemon. Demon. Yeah, it's not like he has a demon. But what it really is, is it's a, it's a conscience. It's a conscience. It's a conscience that tells him, hey, you need to stop. You're going too far. He points out that it, it doesn't tell him to do something. It doesn't tell him, hey, hey, say this, say this. But what it does do, it's an inner voice that tells him when he's supposed to stop. Now again, this idea of having a conscience, to us, it's like, it's Tuesday. That's so obvious. It isn't obvious. It's something that was introduced into the world. You find the idea of a conscience pretty, pretty specific to Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. The idea of a conscience is pretty specific to those Abrahamic faiths. It's first introduced in, in the Old Testament. Before that, not common sense. And so, he's charged with essentially refusing to recognize the Athenian gods and with um, introducing this, this new god called his daemon. The next slide, I'll have the spelling for you. And then he's charged with a second offense, corrupting the youth of Athens. He's charged with corrupting the youth. So there's two main charges. Impiety, rejecting the religions of Athens, and corrupting the youth. And there were three main prosec uh, yeah, there were three people who brought the charges against him. The one who's best known to history is a dude named Melitus. Uh, Melitus was the main prosecutor. It's said that he was a poet. So they brought a guy who was, who was um, uh, supposed to be very good with words to prosecute Socrates. Socrates, as we're going to see, absolutely just destroys him. First off, Melitus is said to be very young. Socrates, at this point, is 70 years old. So Socrates doesn't take kindly to this youngin who's questioning him. Which tells us, by the way, a lot about Socrates' character. He rejects the fact that this person is... is I'm sorry, he... he um, he points out that this person is young, and says that that's a very negative, and uh, states as though it's a very negative thing, which is weird. We're going to see. Um, but other than that, he's unknown. 
There are stories that he was killed later on, but we don't really know what happened to Meletus. So, two things I want you to add is impiety and corrupting the youth. Questions about it? All right. So as for, as for impiety, he was given the opportunity to cross-examine Meletus. And, so, and, and Meletus, by the way, was able to get him to acknowledge that he's got this thing called his daemon. And I have this spelling down here for you. D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. And, and literally translated, it just means a divine something. Because Socrates doesn't know what it is. It's just that when he's, um, when he's questioning somebody, when he's going after somebody, <coughs> he gets this voice in his head that tells him, Hey, man, you're going too far. Chill. Calm down. <coughs> Excuse me. But interestingly enough, so, sorry, so he gets Socrates to admit that he has this thing. And then Meletus is like, Aha! You admit! You introduce a new god! And Socrates, to his credit, says, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a god. I don't know if it's you know, schizophrenia. I have no idea what this thing is. So, no, I'm not introducing gods, but... You said I'm an atheist. You said I don't believe in the gods of Athens. And Melchizedek says, absolutely. He says, well, if I'm an atheist, how can I believe in a god? That makes no sense. So that first charge, he, he, he just destroys pretty simply. And he goes after these charges in a, in a whole bunch of different ways. I'm not going to go into them because they're beyond the scope of what we're doing here. But he does get Melchizedek to point out that, that he's contradicting uh, the charge just by saying that he has this, this, this foreign god. So again, this is something that we would call... A, a, a conscience. It doesn't tell him to do anything. It just tells him to refrain from doing things. And then as for corrupting the youth, he gives a great argument. <laughs> he says, how can I corrupt the youth? And he says, well, you're their teacher, and you're telling them terrible things. And he says, I'm not a teacher. I've never been paid. Teachers get paid. That's not my job. No one's ever paid me to teach them. So how can you call me a teacher if I've never been paid to teach? He says, well, what do you do? He says, well, I just walk around. And I ask people questions. And then young people follow me. And then they, they hear me asking questions. But if you remember from before, I was saying that Socrates didn't just go after like some poor dude who's you know, building a road and go, hey, what's justice? He's going after like lawyers. He's going after, he's going after priests to ask them, what is piety? What is it to love the gods? He's going after the experts of Athens and asking them questions. And by asking them questions, all he's doing is he's asking them to explain themselves. And in explaining themselves, he reveals that they just don't know anything. They've been told things, and they're just kind of repeating back what they've been told. But they don't actually know any of these things for themselves. So it's kind of like if you, if you read a history book, and then I ask you, oh, so what happened in you know, the War of 1812? And you repeat back to me some things from the history book, and I ask you a few questions, what you're eventually going to say is, I don't know, man. It's, you know, it's just what the book says, okay? But then if I ask the person who wrote the book, what are they going to say? I don't know, man. It's just, what the, I read some other books, and that's what they said. So we don't actually know things for ourselves. Now remember, that might be true belief, but it's not true knowledge, the way that Socrates pointed it out. We haven't experienced it for ourselves, and so therefore it's not something that we, that we don't know. We might be accurate with what we're saying. So because he would go after these, um, these, these uh, leaders of Athens... Young people heard him doing that, and they were like, what's he saying to the, like, like imagine if someone comes in here and, and asks me, hey, Scala, what is it to be, you know, what is the nature of goodness? You know, you, did you study philosophy? I did. Are you an expert in philosophy? I am. <laughs> oh, what? you have a PhD? Yes. So what is the nature of goodness? And I rattle off some definition. Someone's like, oh my God, so you're an expert? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Well, so is good, is good a quality? Or is good in action? Well, what do you mean? Well, if good is a quality, then it's subjective, which means that there's not going to be any kind of goodness. But then if good is an action, it can contradict the quality. So therefore, there's no such thing as a good action, so there is no such thing as good, only negative. And I go, you need to leave. I'm teaching the class right now. <laughs> and then you guys are here, and be like, oh, did you hear the way that guy just, just handed Scal in his ass like that, dude? Man, who is this person? And some of you may like, grab your stuff and follow this person. He's like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, where, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to go talk to, I don't know, 
uh, some mathematics teacher to find out if mathematics even exists. Are you going to do to him what you just did to Scallon? Yeah, let's go. And then young people were following him around. And because they were following him around, then they started going to school. And then their professors at school would say, you know, would talk about, about chronology and time. And then they'd raise their hand and go, what do you mean by time? And the professors would, well, by time, what we mean. And then students start to destroy their teachers just by asking questions. And not by asking questions like, why, 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 why? But by asking that very basic question that we began with, how do you know what you know? And what we come to, to discover is that no one really knows much. <laughs> no one really knows much. Because the systems that we use to gain knowledge are corrupted. Our five senses. You can't trust your five senses. And when you're, and, and, and even then, when you're learning things, you're having to trust the source that it came from, another person. It's kind of like, you've heard the, the, the story before about what does the Earth sit on out in space? It sits on the back of a turtle. You know this, right? It's a big turtle out in space. And the Earth sits on top of the turtle. What's the very, what's the logical question to ask? Well, what's that turtle stand on top of? Well, another turtle, stupid. Oh, what does that turtle stand on? Another turtle, and another turtle. Turtles all the way down. This is the way a lot of our knowledge is. Where did you hear that? I heard that from a teacher. Where did that teacher hear from? They heard from their teacher. Where did they hear it from? Teachers all the way back. Whoever discovered it. <clears throat> Maybe it's true. In fact, there's a, lot, there's a good reason to believe that a lot of what we know is, is true. But we have true belief. So now young people were following Socrates around. And all they were doing was asking questions. And for that, he was accused of corrupting the youth. Socrates said, they have free will. I can't control if they follow me around or not. They're not paying me to be their teacher. They're following me. I'm not following them. I might even encourage them to come with me. In fact, again, we know that he had some disdain for younger people because he had disdain for Melodus. Um, and he points out, and this is very important, he said that no one has been made worse by his teaching. None of my, the people who you call my students, the people who, who ask questions because they hear me ask questions, none of their lives have been made worse. In fact, he, he offers to bring in some, some witnesses from the families of some of his you know, so-called students to ask them what their lives have been like since they started to, to question the, the nature of, uh, of reality in the universe. Unfortunately for Socrates, some of his students did do some stuff. They, they, yeah, they, did, they did cause some mischief. And because he was their teacher, he was the one that, that, that people came to like, I'll do, what's up with your students? And he's like, they're not my students. They just heard me ask some questions, and then they would often burn some buildings down. But that had nothing to do with me. Sometimes talking about Socrates is almost like self-exploration for me. <laughs> it's an autobiography of sorts. So now, uh, only a couple things I want you to get from this. First off, get up. Uh, uh, he was... Blah, blah, blah. He was, uh, he was charged with a, a, I guess I'll take that for now. <laughs> the jury was about 500 people. The way that juries worked back then is you would just go down to the courthouse and go, ah, so what kind of trials do you have today? Uh, we got some guy who stole a puppy. Mm, I don't want that one. Uh, what do you have? Socrates. Socrates is on trial for what? Impiety and corrupting the youth. Oh, I gotta hear that. And then you would just go and sign it for the jury. So his jury was uh, somewhere around 501 people. I've heard numbers between 501 and I've heard 602 for some reason. So we don't know exactly, but it's a big group of people. Uh, he's eventually found guilty. He's found guilty of it. But the reason he's found guilty is quite phenomenal. We'll see. It's, uh, so Plato tells us that it was a very narrow margin. He says that only 30 votes separated the two. So we can gather from that that it was maybe 265 to 236. But we don't know the exact number. We only know that it was close. And that Socrates, if he wasn't Socrates, he probably could have, could have uh, swayed the rest of the jury. But he, Socrates just went Socrates. He was, he was rude. He was arrogant. You know, he was all of these things that a person should guard themselves against being. Uh, no. So after being found guilty, Athenian customs allowed the, 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 I guess now convicted person, to recommend their own sentence. 
Now, he was charged with impiety. That carried the death sentence. Because if you think about it, if the gods are real and you offend the gods, what are the gods going to do to your city? They can destroy the city. Which means that you're endangering the lives of everybody who's in Athens by, by, by rejecting them. So it's a pretty serious thing. It's a death penalty. He's also charged with corrupting the youth and convicted, and that also carries the death penalty with it. Because if you corrupt the youth, then you're corrupting the next generation of Athenians. And if that generation is corrupt, then the next one's going to be corrupt. Tell me if that sounds familiar. And eventually, the society's going to collapse. So you're actually, when you're corrupting the youth, you're destroying Athenian society. So it's a pretty significant charge for, on both cases, in piety and corrupting the youth. But they don't want to kill Socrates. They, they, they simply do not want to do that. So anyway, they give him um, the opportunity to recommend his own, his own punishment, which is customary at the time. So Socrates says, wow, I've been convicted of some pretty serious stuff here. I mean, he said, perhaps worse is this whole idea about corrupting the youth. That's a very serious charge. So, I recommend the following punishment. A fine. And today it would be about a thousand bucks. So that is, I don't have the money, but, my, but uh, Plato and these guys, Senefin, they said they've raised the money. So I, I guess they'll pay it. So it's worth about a thousand bucks. He said, I also suggest that my punishment should be that I get free lunch for life at the Pertanium. The Pertanium is a very prestigious hall in Athens, and it was only open once every few years for the Olympic champions. So if you, if you won a, a laurel, which would be like a gold medal, you would be given this very prestigious banquet um, at the Britannium. Socrates said, I should get free lunch there for life, because after all, I'm the greatest champion that Athens has ever known. I'm doing you a service. And actually, as he's going after them, he says, and by the way, my daemon is not telling me to stop, so I'm going to keep going. And he goes off on the jury. And ultimately he says, and by the way, if all of Athenians, what the, I, I suggest a thousand dollar fine because if all of Athens can't stand up to the questioning of one old man, that's all your society is worth. So let me know what you decide. So the jury comes back overwhelmingly death. <laughs> Kill this dude. But it's interesting. Is he wrong? If your society can't stand up to one person asking questions, if your philosophy can't stand up to one person asking questions, if your ideology is so weak that it can't stand up to a person asking questions, maybe you are a champion for destroying it. So Socrates is sentenced to death, and the mode of death is to drink hemlock. So we have from the death of Socrates that he goes into the chamber, his wife Xanthip is there, and in true Socrates fashion, he's a jackass to her, because she's sad, and he's, she's crying, and so for whatever reasons, and he says, get the women out of here, man, they're crying, they're bringing me down. And he wasn't sad about this at all, he wasn't sad about this death, so his students are gathered around, the executioner comes in, uh, mixes up the hemlock, which is a poison, and his punishment is he has to drink the hemlock, essentially commit suicide. So he gives him, so the, the executioner comes in, mixes up the hemlock. I imagine he uses a, I, I was, I was stirring with my finger, but I guess we do after that. All right, here's, <laughs> probably not, he probably uses a stirrer. And then he hands it to Socrates, and Socrates goes, oh, what do I do? I've never done this before. So, the, so he's got jokes, man, even in his death. And so Socrates, uh, the, I'm sorry, the executioner tells him, drink the hemlock, and then start to walk around. And as you walk around, of course, your blood will flow, and the, and the poison will take effect faster. First, it'll, you'll feel it in your feet. you get a tingling in your feet. You'll get cold. And then it'll start to work its way up your legs, and eventually you won't be able to stand. So you'll be laid down, and then it won't be long after that. It'll reach your heart, and your heart will stop. And so he says, great. So Socrates takes the hemlock, <laughs> downs it, <laughs> takes all the hemlock. Because he's not, worried, he's not worried about dying. And we're going to see why in just a minute. As he drinks the hemlock, he starts walking around. His students are with him. And then, you know, Plato, instead of, they start getting sad. And, and Socrates goes, dude, what? quit getting sad. That's why I sent them away. 
I'm about to go on an incredible journey, and you're bringing me down, man. So if you can't control yourself, you guys need to leave too. And the students got, you're right, teacher, you're right. I'm not your teacher, but okay. So I'm not your teacher. I'm your friend now. Not, never, never that. And so he's walking around, he feels the hemlock start to take effect. He's talking about the, perhaps the nature of the soul, his legs go weak, they catch him, they put him on the table. And as he's about to die, he looks over at his student set and he says, We owe a rooster to Asclepius. Make sure that that debt's paid. And his students tell him, Your debt will be paid back. And he dies. What's interesting is that if we don't know who Asclepius is, it sounds like Socrates dies. And he wants to make sure that his one debt that he has in the world is paid. So we can think, wow, what a moral man. He left his life with no debts. That's not what it means, though. Asclepius is the god of medicine. So what he's telling his, his student is, give a sacrifice to the god of medicine. Because by dying today, I'm being given the medicine of this horrible condition, which is physical existence. He sees physical life and the physical body as the disease that has to be cured. And it's a disease that's cured by the soul. If this makes sense. I'll ignore that. Here's what he means. Everybody's got this? Who needs it? Okay. Socrates believes that the question of how we know, what we know, is a really, really important thing. Because how you know what you know is going to tell you that you're not just some body that's existing on the planet, but you're actually an eternal soul. As he points out, there are things that you don't know that we don't know. So there, so there are things that you know. We don't know how you know them. Like, how do you know what, what perfection is? You've never experienced it. If it's true that all true knowledge comes through experience, then you cannot possibly know what perfection is. But you do. You can't possibly know what, in, what eternity is, what infinity is. But somehow you do know. You've never experienced them before, though. Somehow you know what love is, even if you've never experienced it before. You kind of know that there's this emotion that's, that's on the way. There are all kinds of things in life that you know that you should not know because you've never experienced it. And here's his explanation. Before you were born, you were a soul, a spirit, that ran around out there in the universe, out in the cosmos. In other words, there's this physical world, and then there's this kind of spiritual world that's out there. And while you were out there, you interacted with the idea, the form. And this is called the, idea, uh, the theory of the form. And that's really important, the theory of the forms. Now, while you were out there, you encountered all of these things. Like, for example, you encountered the perfect idea of what a chair is. You encountered the perfect idea of what justice is. That's where you learned what justice is. In other words, these are the perfect. These are the ideal forms of these things. You learned what a, I don't know what love is by being out there. You learned what a desk is. <laughs> In other words, everything that you could possibly imagine, you encountered it out there. You learned what that thing was. That's why you know what these things are. You know what infinity is because you existed in it. That's your nature. Your nature is a soul. You're not the car driving down the street. The car is your body. You're the person driving the car. And when that car crashes, you get out and you go back to the regular world. When you die, Socrates believes, you go back to this spiritual world. And so it's out here that you attempt that you encounter love, a desk, I'm sorry, a death, a chair, justice, infinity, all of these things. But then your parents met, and they ruined everything. Too much patron. And suddenly one day you're screaming to the cosmos, this is wonderful, this is great. Oh, by the way, when you're out there, you may, uh, we're all on that kind of a journey. We're all encountering those things. Which means that sometimes you meet a person and you feel like you've known them your whole life. You probably knew them before. You encountered them out there. Maybe you guys hung out there in that spiritual space and, and, and engaged in these things together. 
Maybe that's how you know the person. And I'm sure you all know people like that. You, you, you just meet them and you're like, wow, I feel like I've known you my whole life. This is why. You encountered them. You, you do know them. But then, like I said, your parents hook up and you are sucked down into this body, into this world. And your soul is pulled down into this physical body. You ever meet a, not meet, that's a stupid thing to ask. You ever see a newborn? It's like, it's like looking like, where the hell am I? What just happened? And maybe when, you, when you're born, you look over in the corner and you see this weird thing. It, it, it kind of looks like that. It's an imitation, though. It's a, degenerate, it's a degenerative imitation of the idea of the perfect. It's not a perfect chair. It's a, it's a pretty good chair. You know, but it's not a perfect chair by any stretch of the imagination. But, and the person who made the chair was making it based off of that thing that they've experienced before. They're not conscious of it. But that's what they're doing. You remember, we behave in unconscious ways all the time. So he's un you're unconsciously imitating that chair. When you're, when you're loving a person, when, the, when you're doing the things that you think love is supposed to be, you're imitating that thing that's up there. You make mistakes, yeah. You screw up, yeah. But that's because you're not perfect. Because everything down here is corrupted. Because it's an imperfect imitation of the things that you encountered up here. That's why you won't find perfect justice. But you'll find something close, maybe. And the more that you study it, the more that you are reminded of what those things are. And this is why, as Socrates says, the job of a teacher is not to tell you, here's what justice is. Here's what a desk is. Here's what love is. A teacher's job is to ask you questions to help you remember those things that you've encountered before. Because I can't necessarily... If I, I don't have to tell you what justice is. I can just ask you the questions. And since we're both going to be referencing the same, the same thing, the same form, we'll both come to the same conclusion. And the more time that you spend trying to remember these things and studying these things, the, more, the, the closer you're going to get to the, to the ideal. But again, just like your body so is, a, is a cheap imitation, say cheap, well, in some cases, I suppose, but you, in, your body is an imitation, a degenerative imitation of your soul. The desk that's down here is the degenerative desk. The chair is a degenerative version of the chair that's up there. Justice, love, all of these things. So everything is good right there? Everything is perfect. Literally perfect. That's how you know what perfection is. You encounter the perfect idea of those things, the ideal version. This is why it's called idealism. Because you encounter the ideal version out there in the world of performance. And this is why sometimes, you, maybe you've met somebody and they just can't get their shit. They can't get their shit together. And they always seem to screw up. And you have a soft spot for them. And you don't know why you put up with them, but you do. And sometimes you might say something like, you guys just don't know them the way I do. That's because you may have encountered the, the perfect version of them out there. You know that that's who they really are. Because you've encountered it before. And that's why you have that soft spot. Because you want to see this version of them down here in this world. Because you know what they're capable of. But maybe... Their interactions with the world have corrupted them so much that they have difficulty living up to that ideal. But that's our job in life, to live up to these ideals that we've encountered, because that is who you really are. You ever go walking around and you just feel like, I don't know, man, like I just don't belong, <laughs> you know? Or maybe that you feel like you're being pulled and you really belong someplace else? You do. That's who you are. That's where you belong. You don't belong here. This life is just a, a temporary thing because once, you, once this physical body dies away, just like when your car crashes, you, the real you, the psychic you that Jung is talking about, exits that body and goes back to the, to the world where you really belong, because this is where you're from. You get to finally go back home. So when Socrates is saying that death is the cure for life, he's not just making some sitting in his closet emo statement. He really does mean this, that death is the cure for life. Not that this life is so horrible. There's lots of life here that you can experience, and it's, and it's great. All he's saying is, 
this is just better. Like, dessert's great, right? But so is dinner. So don't be in a rush for dessert, guys. Eat your dinner. It's good. <laughs> it's good. And get the most that you possibly can out of it. Don't, don't toss away the wings because you know that you're getting peanut butter and chocolate ice cream after that. I'll take the wings. I'll take them both. I'll take them both, man. Because that's who you really are. That's the full. That's the full you. Yeah. Would you come back down after you go back up? Good question. You come back down after you go back up. I don't know. <laughs> Socrates never mentioned it, but this does open the door for for um, um, reincarnation. Suggests it. By the way, Socrates. And again, this is all a, a response to that question of how do you know what you know? This is why I say it's not a small thing, because how you know what you know can lead you to, to understand that you are this thing, this perfect immortal soul. That your job in this life is to imitate that thing. This is why it doesn't, like, nothing really matters. Like, someone comes along, like, say, for example, you believe in charity, because you understand it's good to help people. And then you help a person... And then they take your help, and then they take it for granted. And some people are like, oh, man, I'm not going to help anybody ever again. Why not? Because people are jerks. What's that got to do with you, though? Just because they're corrupted doesn't mean you have to be. So often we allow other people to determine our behavior patterns. So listen, and, you know, I'm a nice person. Are you really, though? It's a great way to get the truth out of people. Seriously? Are you, though? Well, okay, I'm nice to people who are nice to me. Well, then you're not a nice person. You're a credit card. You're giving and taking and giving and taking. Are you a nice person or not? If you're a nice person, it doesn't matter how other people behave. It just bothers me. Oh, it's your pride. It's your ego. What good has ever come from pride and ego? I can list, by the way, centuries of, of evil and wickedness that have come from pride and ego. I might have a difficult time coming up with a post-it note of good stuff that's come from pride and ego, though. You're going to notice that people who, whose egos are too big and they're too prideful, they, we can't be around them. You know, they're not, Those are folks who are so degenerate, they're not trying to achieve their ideal selves. They're indulging in this, in this ugliness. Who cares if other people are those things? What are you? Because if, it matters, if, if being good matters, then you're good. Period. There's nothing at the end of that. Good, comma, when people are good to me, scratch that part out. If it's good to be good. Don't let other people determine your behavior. Someone says something that, that, that ticks you off, then you're allowing them to control your mind. You'd be pissed off if you're walking down the street and they took control of your body, threw you in prison. You'd be pissed off. But for some reason, we just hand over control of our mind to people who use words. That would make sense if you're a little kid you didn't know any better. You know better. You know better. And you're only injuring yourself. You're only harming yourself because you're taking yourself further and further and further away from this ideal that you're trying to return to. So, when Socrates is drinking that hemlock, that's what he's looking forward to. Notice he didn't go out there and, and jump off the building and be like, I can't wait to get back. No. He understood that this life was a way of refining ourselves to, 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 to yearn back to this. And this is why you feel like you belong someplace else, because you do. This is why you feel like you're not of this world, because you're not. Everything here is just temporary. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Complaints? Criticism? Critiques? What's that? 